said. Uh, I've been a resident of San Antonio since 2009. My wife's active duty military and I go where she goes and we've been here since then. Um, we did a little stint in 2007, but I really didn't get into the climbing scene down here until 09 when we were restationed here. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been climbing for, this is my 30th year this coming summer. I started at the age of 10 or 11. You can do the math and how old I am now. Um, and just did an outdoor education course that was trying to get kids out into the woods and fell in love with high ropes and all that kind of stuff. And soon thereafter, I was literally taking apart my swing set to make climbing gear. I don't recommend that, but that's what I was doing um, to climb all the trees in my backyard and um, got to climb outside. I grew up in New York originally. Um, and so I had the gunks about an hour and a half from my house. So I had a kind of a traditional upbringing in the gunks. And since then, I've tried to climb as far around the world as I can and um, end up in San Antonio and uh, was lucky enough to figure out that there's some climbing here, which we'll get into uh, momentarily. So um, hopefully uh, I can get as much information as I can out to you. And then obviously I welcome questions or whatever um, and just see how we roll with this. So um, I'll do a little history first and we'll get into kind of what uh, Medwall is after that. Hopefully the history isn't too boring, but it's kind of a good background here. Um, so I think we'll get started. Let me see, Joe, if we got the share screen. Yep, here we go. Let's do that. All right, so uh, Medwall, uh, yeah, Tuesday 27th, okay. So general description, so basically Medwall is a limestone cliff, for those of you that don't know anything about it, um, up north of 1604. It's kind of near Paisano's Parkway, um, and there's an elementary school up there. Uh, the easiest way to find it these days is it's right off the Salado Creek Greenway. Um, they put that in since metal was first climbed back um, 20, 20 years ago. So we'll get into kind of the history about how that all developed. Um, in general, the cliff actually faces due north. So in the wintertime, it can get pretty chilly because it's in the shade most of the day. Um, right now, you can catch some shade depending on the time of day, but um, just because it faces north, your blair will still get cooked at the bottom. Um, it's primarily an outdoor sport climbing area. Um, it's similar to Rymer's Ranch in that it's bolted limestone sport climbing. Um, there is a little bit of bouldering at the base, and I think some people are exploring that more. But for the most part, we're talking routes um, out here at uh, Medwall. So, how do I go next page? Okay, there we go. So, they're basically, from what I've been able to tell, mind you, I've lived here about a decade, and I've talked to a lot of the climbers that were here before me. Medwall has kind of four phases of history. Um, there was kind of a mid-90s to early 2000s exploration. There was a period, 08, 09, where activity really picked up. And then uh, the 2000s, early 2010s, till when it was closed in 2015, was the period I was involved in with some other locals as well. And then it was closed from 2015 until recently, which we'll get into. And then essentially we have from its opening in May, uh, June, we have the, t the TCC and the Access Fund and kind of its new future in history, which is really exciting. Um, so mid 90s, early 2000s. So a lot of people don't realize that San Antonio actually had a pretty active climbing group in the mid 90s. There's some older climbers here that were really active both at E-Rock and abroad, um, kind of the James Crump era E-Rock. They did a lot of climbing around here, a lot of development uh, out at the Pecos that most people don't know about. Um, rumored to be hundreds of sport climbs they put up out there. Uh, and I think they started looking a little bit at Medicine Wall as kind of a local backyard thing. Um, not a whole lot of development out there, but a little bit. So Metro originally was developed as a top rope area. That was kind of how the central Texas climbing community would start to explore limestone. Um, Rymers was actually originally all top ropes. Um, they talked to um, Milton Rymers about climbing out there back in the day. And originally they would just run a bunch of top ropes down before they really started bolting for lead climbing. So the same is true for Medwall. The original bolting and climbing out there was primarily done via anchors on the top of the wall. Um, which were out there up until it was all removed um, when it was closed down. So you can you could still see some of the old bolts along the top of the wall that have been out there for quite some time. Um, the name Medicine Wall actually comes from a bunch of Bamsi residents. So there is a medical tie 
Um, I've actually met one of them. He worked with my wife at Bamsey for a couple of years before he retired from the military. But when they were residents of this outdoor group of uh, medical climbers, we would go out there and bolting some of the original lead routes out there, mainly on Old Testament is what this guy told me. His name is Chris White is one of the climbers that was out there. And so some of those original lead routes on Old Testament were done by actual medical residents at Bamsey. Uh, so from what I can tell, it was probably something like Texas Caterpillar, Bermuda Triangle, some of the original Old Testament routes. Um, but I really do need to dig into this more because in the time I've spent out at Medwall, I always meet climbers that are like, tell me stories like, we were out here top roping back in 2002 and, and that kind of thing. So hopefully as it opens back up and we meet more people, we'll start to get some more of that history kind of trickling down and um, we'll be able to kind of put it all together at some point in um, a written history. So after that period, um, from what I can tell is it pretty much stayed as is for a period of time. And then around 2008, 2009, um, a new group of climbers started taking a look at Medicine Wall. Um, they, they used some of the top rope anchors to explore stuff, but then they were the, the group that really started bolting some of the newer, harder lead routes out there. Um, Honeycomb is a classic that was um, bolted. Uh, Breezy Fear of Falling on Buddha Wall. And we'll, I'll show you some of the walls in a little bit. Um, and then New Testament wall, which is the real steep wall to the right of Old Testament, um, has some of the kind of the, the premier harder routes out there. Um, Dancing with bow-legged women and cute without the E are both kind of mega classic 11s out there. Um, that group uh, I can see here was led. Lauren Graham was an, uh, a local Austin climber. If you've ever been up the Rhymers in North Shore, he's been pretty active up there as well. Um, and then he recruited a bunch of local climbers, um, namely Lecknell, Matt King, Blake Edge, Kevin Kuhn, and Ted Butler. And the, Lauren posted this years ago on Facebook, but he basically said that um, I think he had a girlfriend at the time down here, and he started developing these routes so everyone would have something to climb down here. And most of that bolting was done, he said, in about a month, a month period of time. Um, I was just throwing some stuff in and seeing what would go, and it was kind of neat. Um, and this is also about the time that uh, the Facebook group uh, page where you start to see San Antonio climbers show up was I think originally started and it was essentially maybe 10 people on there kind of sharing stories about who was going to go out to the wall and whatnot so that that was kind of phase two of the development and then around 2010 uh, I, I moved here in 09 and at that time there weren't any real climbing gyms thank you Armadillo uh, so we were all any of the climbers that were in town were kind of looking for different places to climb and where I lived we all kind of ended up um, going to the rim lifetime fitness they have the classic kind of gym walls there and for a while we had a pretty good core group of climbers that were all pretty serious about it and getting out and trying to uh, explore the area and one of the head route setters there that ran the wall was judge reinhardt uh, who pr people have probably met either through armadillo or elsewhere and he told me about medicine wall said you should come out sometime and i went out there with judge and uh some of the other lifetime uh, people i was climbing with and we started looking at medicine wall uh, and seeing, wow, not only is there routes to climb here, but there's a lot of potential for m more routes to be developed out there. So this is the first time I was in a place in all my climbing years where there was a lot of kind of new stuff to look at and a, an ability to contribute to the climbing community. So I started looking at some of the other new walls and essentially vertical gardening, cleaning up a lot of routes with some help from a, a buddy of mine, Steve Io. Um, and I did malpractice wall, which was a, just a lot of dirt shoveling and pruning and whatnot, and started filling in some of the walls with more moderate routes and just getting everything kind of cleaned up and I would say improved. Some of the hardware was starting to age out a little bit, so we started fixing some of that. And in that same time, we just started seeing more people were coming in. And every time we were out there, just like Joe said, it's kind of neat. It really started to become a bit of a, a central meeting point to meet climbers. So I met... That's where I met some of the older San Antonio climbers that were showing up there and telling me stories, but also people from out of town, a lot of military that were rotating through would hear about this somehow and we'd all meet out there at the wall. So it was starting to gain in popularity. You, pro you pretty much would always see at least a pair of climbers out there anytime you went out. Um, back then, you would either would hike in from a side road or a lot of people would actually drive in on this bumpy dirt road and we'd park right at the base of the wall. So classic kind of good old days, we could just drive all our equipment in 
and um, it made developing routes a lot easier because you could just walk to your car to go get your tools and whatnot. But about this time, as it started to pick up in popularity, uh, questions started being asked by climbers about what the access status was. Um, and at that time, a lot of us actually thought that the city had already purchased the property for the future Greenbelt. Um, that was starting to expand. It's nowhere near as big as it is today, but um, we actually even ran into a park police officer on a four by four driving up the creek bed one time and chatted with him. And we thought that actually the city already owned the property. Um, so we decided to meet with them, and this is probably circa 2013, and see if we could officially kind of get climbing on the map uh, for something that they would allow on their property. Because at some point we knew they were going to bring a trail through there and um, issues would come up. So around, I think 2013, myself, Steve, and Joe Sulak, who's another huge prominent kind of a San Antonio climber, you've probably climbed routes of his up in um, Rymers at some point. We met with Parks and sat down, literally went down to the town hall and sat down with Parks Department and said, hey, we'd like to have climbing on, the, on your radar in the future. And they basically said, nope, we want nothing to do with that. Um, mainly a liability issue. They just weren't excited about that. I mean, they had concerns about mountain bikers jumping off of dirt jumps on their trails. So at that point, it kind of ended up being almost like a stalemate where they weren't quite there yet, but uh, the climbing still continued on. Um, let's see here. Okay. So basically after that meeting, uh, Medwell continued to increase in popularity and at that point, the development around the area, housing and the trail started to pick up a little bit and it got more attention. And unfortunately, in early 2015, there was an accident at the wall. Um, two, we think were climbers, fell off the top of Medwall. Um, and it made the local news. And really, no one's really sure what happened with that accident. Um, the best people could determine was it was some kind of repelling mistake. Um, and they fell off the top of the wall. And Unfortunately, for, um, it was a sad event, but unfortunately that also got Medwall prominently in the news. It was on Ken's uh, Five and all the local news stations. And the landowner, who was a local developer, it was not the city at that time, essentially shut it down. Um, they put a lot of no trespassing signs up there. They had someone patrolling um, occasionally going through there. And soon thereafter, they basically hired a company out of Austin to come in and remove all the hardware off the wall. So every bolt that was on med wall was grinded off the wall or removed and unbolted. So med wall was completely cleaned off. And that was it, 2015, basically turn off the lights when you leave, um, that's what happened. And the climbers are kind of left in a state of, net, well now what? Um, and for a couple of years there, we really were kind of floundering. And thankfully Armadillo came around and kind of saved us a little bit, particularly in the summertime. Um, and provided a new location to uh, climb, but climbers always still were looking for an outdoor resource. It's just something we like to do as climbers. Um, and I kind of kept an eye on it, watching to see if property had changed hands. But about this time, uh, the Central Texas Mountaineers was a group based in Austin. They were pretty Austin focused, decided to kind of change their focus, and they switched over to be the Texas Climbers Coalition with the idea being that they were gonna be a broader organization to try to expand climbing in Texas. Um, and around that time, this is probably 2017 or so, the Access Fund was really making a big push to try to expand public land across the country. And they, they put um, people in charge to have a focus on Texas. Texas does not have a lot of public lands. Um, and the Access Fund actually uh, put someone in charge of being just in charge of Texas. And currently that's Brian Tickle, who has been working a lot with legal side of things with Texas legislature, but also actively pursuing a lot of different land acquisitions and whatnot throughout Texas. So Inks Ranch is the big granite area up near Enchanted Rock. He's been working actively on that side. So we have those two entities starting to look at projects and Medwall was on their short list of maybe someday. Um, well, the story I've been told talking to TCC was sometime around 2018, San Antonio Parks finally got around to trying to expand the trail north of 1604. And the landowner um, tried to sell or offer the cliff to the city as part of that expansion along the Greenbelt, the bike path stuff there. 
And the city, again, didn't want anything to do with the, the cliff. But because of these conversations in the past and the TCC had kind of kept in touch with some of the Parks Department people, the city put the landowner in touch with TCC and the Access Fund. And through what I've been told is a very difficult almost year of negotiations and back and forth and legal everything, the Access Fund and the TCC were able to essentially carve out Medwall from the rest of the land ownership. And TCC was able to buy the property and the access fund has a recreational easement on that property. And basically what that means is the access fund legally has a right to use that land forever for hiking and climbing. Um, regardless if the TCC somehow goes out bankrupt or whatever, has to sell the property, whoever owns that chunk of land has to let us climb on it. So it's actually a really big win across the board for the access fund and climbers in general. So that was awesome. That was in December, 2018. We had a big meeting in Armadillo. Everyone was very excited about that. Unfortunately, because the land is an island um, at, with private property around it, both for commercial development and the Creek way with the green belt, um, there was no legal way to access it at that time. Basically in the negotiations, which I heard were pretty hard, um, TCC agreed to say that our legal access, climbers legal access, would be via the yet to be completed bike paths. And the agreement was essentially we had to wait until the bike paths were complete before we could access the land. So that was from December 2018 till essentially sometime March, April of 2020. So that was a really long period of time to know you could climb, but we can't get there yet. But sometime in that spring, the city finally finished that bike path and we were able to start accessing it to get it ready to open up to climbing. Um, so I've covered a little bit of that. Um, basically, let me make sure I'm um, covered all that there. So spring of 2020, sometime around February, this is pre-pandemic to a certain degree, um, TCC finally hears from the city that the trail is almost ready to be open to the public, almost as a pretty loose term that we discovered. Um, and TCC says, all right, we gotta start getting the wall ready to open. So um, I'd been communicating with TCC as one of the developers back in the day. Um, Judge also had ties to both, to multiple phases of development. So he was a really good resource. Um, and then Joe being a, a pretty worldly climber, having done development his own, we started going out to the wall uh, to get it ready to go. And what I mean by that is, let's see if we have here, cliff cleanup and prep. So basically that wall had sat untouched for five or six years. And contrary to proper belief, Texas, particularly this area we live in, is really green and things like to grow everywhere um, on the cliffs, in the creek beds, and whatnot. So we had about six years of dirt and growth that needed to be kind of cleaned up off the wall. Um, in addition to that, TCC, knowing how much use it was going to get, kind of said, um, and we had talked about this, it said, we need to make it better than it was and really prep it for um, general use. It's going to literally be 20 feet off a public bike path. We're in a major metropolis. Um, it needs to be developed properly so it can be an example for access fund, general public, or whatever. So we really went out to try to develop Medwall in a way that um, was beneficial to both the new climber that probably never climbed before was just getting started as well as kind of the salty veteran that um, wants to run some laps and get a good workout in. So over the course of the springtime, we put in, I think we're north of 300 hours of work out there, um, cleaning up a lot of loose rock that needed to come down, getting a lot of the growth and greenery off the wall, um, and then starting to kind of plan how we were going to rebolt Medwall. Um, and we have the poison ivy scars and all the other stuff to, uh, to prove it. But um, we, were, we would go out probably two, three times a week at dawn and work for several hours until we were done and get it kind of ready to go. Until, and um, what I mean by ready to go is first cleaning and then we had to plot the route and then put the bolts in. I'll get into a little bit, but essentially we tried to do the best and most modern hardware we could on the wall. Um, to kind of show an example for the, essentially the rest of the country, this is how you do it. So it's all stainless steel. Uh, it's all glue and bolts. And I'll talk about that a little bit if you have any questions about that. But essentially, we drill a hole in the wall and we glue 
a, a metal bolt into the wall. Um, and it looks a little weird at first, but it's actually one of the strongest kind of anchors you can put in the wall. Um, they're more common in Europe than here, but they're starting to catch on here as well. Um, and then we tried to set it up where everyone could get off the wall safely with clip-in lowers like you'd see at Rhymers. Um, so you people don't have to um, mess around with retying a rope at the top of the wall. Everyone can kind of just climb up, clip and lower. So it's a bit of an outdoor gym, uh, but given the location and what people are going to be using it for, that's actually probably a good thing where it's a great learning zone as well. Um, so now I've told you kind of the history of the wall, just a little bit of background getting there. Um, the, basically the only way or, uh, place to park is just inside 1604 at the Salado Trailhead, um, Salado Creek Greenbelt Trailhead. Um, and we can probably send a follow-up email in terms of actual directions and whatnot, but it's about as easy as easy can get. There's a really large parking lot there, probably holds 40 to 50 cars. And then there's a nice trailhead sign and a paved path, 12 feet wide. Um, and it's pretty much dead flat, a little bit uphill and downhill. You can just walk there. It's about, it's pretty much exactly one mile from your car to the main wall areas. Um, you can also ride a bike. I highly recommend it. Um, I've been riding a bike with a little tow behind trailer with all my gear back and forth the whole time. Um, makes for a nice pleasant ride there. So you can just park, drive in. It's free to everybody um, to use the bike path and you just ride in and the cliffs are, will be there when you get there. Um, so a little more overview here. Uh, the cliff band is essentially on the left-hand side. And when you, when you start walking up the trail, riding up the trail, you'll see the cliffs kind of pop out of the woods on your left-hand side. And they basically go Buddha belly, Metro, Old Testament, New Testament, and malpractice. It's really one big cliff, but the climbers, we all started kind of naming each prominent zone um, or sector. Sectors is kind of a European term where that's sector whatever. So we've named the different sectors because they're kind of natural breaks between the different parts of the wall. But it's essentially, it's probably about a 1100 foot cliff all in of usable climbing there's more of it that tcc owns but it's probably not really good for any kind of major climbing or whatnot so when you get in there you can basically park your bike down at the base of the wall we're actually we're going to work on bike racks or some point we'll, um, get some trees cut up and make a nice bike rack or whatever but really easy to get to about as good as it can get in terms of getting to go get a nice afternoon climbing session in um, so here's another overview uh, of the different sectors of wall. As you can see, it really is one big cliff band, but we've kind of named the different sectors. These are the current ones. There's probably some opportunity for more climbing in there we're looking at, but those are the major sectors right now um, for climbing. Um, so if you haven't been out there before, um, Medwall is pretty unique. It's actually, the rock out there is limestone. It's some of the better limestone that I've climbed in this part of Texas. Uh, it's not as good as out at the Pecos from what I understand, but in general, it's better than Rhymer's Rock. Um, it's a really nice, hard gray limestone. There are a couple of sections here and there, but for the most part, it tends to be really good. Uh, it's, because of that, it's also taller than most of the other climbing um, in, in the central Texas area. So, Unlike Rhymers, where you can get away with a shorter rope, you really need a, a full length rope here. So at least 50 meters, Old Testament is 25 meters high. I usually tell people 60, just to give yourself a little wiggle room. Um, so definitely a 60 meter rope. Same thing, uh, quick draws. These routes are long and they're bolted well. So a dozen plus quick draws will not go to waste on some of those routes. Um, the anchors are all uh, clips, but I think some of those routes are north of 12 bolts on the long ones. Most of them aren't that long, but six quick draws won't cut it um, at, at Medwall. Um, your usual stuff, you're going to need harness, shoes, blade device, helmet, um, that kind of thing. Um, I highly recommend this time of year bug repellent. There's a, some of those neighborhoods have a, the water drains down into that creek bed and they'll sit there. It can be really pretty with ducks and frogs and all sorts of other stuff but they also have a lot of mosquitoes that will try to carry you away at the right time of year. So bring your bug spray. Um, sunshade, like I said, it gets shade at certain times of day. You can kind of, the climbers up on the wall get the shade. If you're belaying, you will feel like you're standing on the surface of the sun at times. So be prepared to have a hat or some kind of shade and bring plenty of water. Um, there are no facilities out there. So be prepared. The closest facilities are where you parked, um, which actually isn't that bad, but 
Um, everything you bring out there, plan to bring back in. So no trash cans, you need to use a restroom. You gotta go back to the, the trailhead to do that. Um, and like I said, bike, really great way to get out there and we'll be working on bike racks, hopefully in the near future here, we'll see how it goes. Um, so lastly, Joe asked me to specifically talk about um, anchors at Medwall. So going into rebolting, um, a lot of times if people have climbed at Rhymers or elsewhere, even in a gym, you'll, you're probably used to seeing two bolts side by side. Um, there's some historical reasons why that's ended up going back to kind of the piton days of yore. Um, but in reality, you don't need bolts side by side. It's kind of just a legacy uh, setup. And in most places, like in Europe and whatnot, they tend to do what's called an inline or a vertical anchor. And the reason you try to do that is if your bolts are spaced horizontally, um, your rope kind of has to do this multiple bend up, down, and over, and it tends to twist your rope a little bit. And so when rebolting Medwall, we try to do it in the most modern way we could that's really convenient. So you'll see essentially two setups. The one on the left, which is kind of what we call a vertical French setup, um, where you clip both of them, but you really are only weighting the top anchor or the middle and right setups where we have the two carabiners able to meet in the middle where you can clip and lower. And both of those are great because you have a single point where your rope bends and that tends to be a lot less twisting. And in the case of the one on the left, the, the French setup, we're actually only wearing out one piece of equipment. So when time comes to replace it, the bottom piece has probably taken almost no wear. It costs less in terms of maintenance and whatnot to, to uh, replace that piece when it comes. Um, we, we have gotten questions even when I'm out there about should we use our own quick draws or whatnot. Uh, it's really up to you, but the whole point of putting steel carabiners and having the TCC fund this is that we want people to be as safe as possible by just clipping into the fixed gear and using that to lower off of. Anytime you can avoid having to mess around with rope switching out or untying and retying at the top of a wall uh, is an, an advantage. And I, I'm a big believer after many, many years of climbing that we should be making it as safe as we can, particularly in a sport climbing setting like this. There are other realms where the game is a little bit different, but here I encourage everyone to just climb up, clip, lower down, um, and use, take advantage of that hardware that's been put in there for you. And if you're really thankful for it, make a contribution to the Texas Climbers Coalition who's helped fund a lot of this. Um, so, so that's my long-winded, I tend to talk a lot, uh, spiel in terms of the, the background of Medwall. Let's see if I can jump out of here and stop our screen sharing. And uh, I think Joe can open up some questions here in a second. Let me switch you over back to, oh, I think I have to, switch. let me stop the screen okay. sharing. Here. I should be unmuted. You can keep oh, there your you screen go. up. All yeah. right, let me see if I can turn off screen sharing here. Hold on one second. Oh, it's fine. Is it still running? Um, yeah, there's a few questions that, well, I had a few that I wanted to kind of prompt. And um, one thing I wanted to make sure you you didn't miss it, that was in the chat was uh there was a there was a shout out for dr markel from <laughs> joe joe santa maria he said she was his staff in 2016 he was a general surgery intern so there we go small world it is a small world it's funny like the more people climb I, one of the reasons i've been in it as long as i have and i love the climbing community is um you could be literally in new hampshire somewhere climbing and and I've had this happen. I've been four pitches up a climb in New Hampshire and met someone at a belay and got to chatting and, oh, where are you from? Well, we're currently stationed in Washington. Oh, do you know so-and-so? And literally, we had climbed with the same partners from other opposite sides of the country. So just a really cool uh, community in terms of meeting people and whatnot. So I encourage people that if you're a lifer, always chat people up at the cliff, tell them where you're from, what you've been doing, because you'd be surprised. Um, as big as climbing has gotten, it's still a really small community for the most part, which is really fun. All right, and Michael wanted to make sure that Andrew got some credit for his cleaning efforts um, because he's got the poison ivy to prove it. And um, I know Matt and Judge and Andrew each got really bad bouts of poison ivy. I somehow avoided it. I'm not sure 
I mean, I usually react a lot, um, but these guys put in a lot of time and effort and they paid for it in a lot of ways. So bad poison ivy was one of them. So when you climb up there and you don't see any poison ivy, they, they took that one for the team. Um, and there is more out there. So people should be cautious with like, there's, there's sections of wall that are not ready to climb yet, primarily because we're a little bit um, shell shocked from the last two poison ivy bounce. So we'll get to that at some point. Um, I guess one, one quick thing would be, um, and we've got a Lisa here who's like a San Antonio rep from TCC. Um, she, I think she's marketing director, I think if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they're helping to fund this. So could you kind of put into like a rough amount of time and money that it costs like per route? Like, cause it is, it's a very time intensive process, but it also, you know, the bolts cost money, the anchors cost money. Um, what's like a, an approximate time and cost for each route? For me, Joe, or for Elisa? For you. So a, a good way to think about this, um, and it, it's gonna vary from area to area in the country, but I would tell people figure each route costs a minimum of $100 in hardware and anywhere from 10 to 15 hours of physical labor to prep. And those are on the routes that were already in there in the past. So right now I think we're north of 25 routes, um, right around there is what we put in. So there's $2,500 of hardware in the wall with plenty more to come. So I, people always kind of think of as climbing being a free activity. It is to a certain degree, but I always want to encourage people to think about there are behind the scenes costs that make you safer um, in terms of that nice new bolt that I think the, the new ones we're putting in can hold up about 9,000 pounds. Um, they're not super expensive, but they add up over time. So uh, one of the nice things about MedWall is everything out there is brand new and is about as good as it's going to get. Um, anywhere else you climb in the country, it's probably going to be less quality than what we have at MedWall, which is really one of the exciting things. I'm a hardware geek. Joe will tell you, I can talk your out for hours about a carabiner if I wanted to. So um, we've really been doing a good job trying to put the best stuff in. Um, if anyone wants to nerd out with me, I can tell you, I, literally four hours I can talk about just bolts um, in terms of what's going in on the wall. So it's, um, it, it, there is a cost involved. So we've always been encouraged people like, hey, if you have a good time and you felt like you had a safe activity out there and you haven't done so, kick some bucks over to TCC. Um, I make a point anywhere I travel, like you go to like, um, last time I, last summer I traveled to Squamish, which is a big granite area up in, um, British Columbia. You go shopping for a carabiner. I'll drop five bucks on the bolt fund up there because somewhere along the line in your climbing career, you're going to come up and you're going to have to clip a really rusty, ugly bolt. And you're going to hate life for that time period. And when you see a brand new stainless steel bolt, it makes you really, someone put that in at some point and it costs them money. So it's kind of one of those pay it forward things. Um, if you, if you can do that, awesome. And um, you're a better climber for it when you do. Um, I just, I just want to say this about Matt real quick. Before I moved back to San Antonio, I knew of Matt from when I was learning how to bolt when I lived in Tucson. And I was looking at like internet forums about bolting and the process and the, the math and the physics. And there's this dude, Matt M on Mountain Project, who was like, knows everything and every bolting question he answers with so much detail and I just kept thinking who is this guy that lives in San Antonio and knows everything about bolts and then fortunately when I moved back here I got to got to meet Matt but he truly like we're really lucky to have him leading this um, because as far as making choices on the hardware we need and the best practices I mean Matt I mean he he knows the best way to do it all. So, and we're doing a really good job because of that. A um, couple questions from here, a really good one. Um, so somebody asked, are there any volunteering opportunities? And I think to go along with that is like, apart from just like volunteering days and maybe when there's like community help out days, but what are some ways that people can be um, just good stewards of the crag while we're out there? Um, what are ways to report, let's say there's loose rock or a bad bolt or a, a, an anchor needs replacing? Um, how can we be stewards and how can people contribute in a, in a volunteering form? 
Yeah, great question. So um, the first one first, because I've had several people ask me, like, we want to help. Um, and the big answer is uh, TCC, we're trying to figure out in, in a normal world, in a normal 2020, we would have had a big grand opening and trail work days where everyone shows up and we all give each other high fives and do that. Unfortunately, that's not really a good idea right now. Um, us all hanging out, uh, sweating and breathing hard, trying to do trail work is really not in the best interest of both our PR department or our health at this point. So um, those are to be continued is probably the best way to describe it is we have ideas and where we can do that work. Um, we're still trying to figure out the best way we can do it. What I'm anticipating, and I have to get with Aliza and the TCC a little bit more, is we'll probably do some kind of small trail days where we can spread people out. Um, the, the trail continues to need work both at the base. Primarily, there, there is a trail that accesses parts of the top of the wall, and that um, definitely needs work. There's going to be a fair amount of work up there to get the rock stable in certain places and try to clean that up a lot. So those bigger projects are coming um, and pr probably when it's not 103 degrees out in the afternoon is another reason. Um, in the meantime, in terms of uh, stewardship, uh, if you go out to Medwall, you'll notice it's still pretty green out there. Um, we did scrub those walls. I promise you old Testament at one point had nothing green growing on the routes. And in three weeks and one rainstorm, everything tends to grow back this, Texas loves to grow things in the summertime, unfortunately. So if you're out there and you're lowering off a route and you have five minutes, just pull some of the little green things off the wall. Or if you see a loose rock and you can safely get it down, just kind of do that kind of pick up your room is probably the best way to describe it is just do a little tidying up. You'd be amazed. Um, we went out there one time and there was all this brush we had cleared up. And there's this big pile. It looked like this giant mess. And two of us in 10 minutes were able to clear all of that stuff off the base and get it stacked up in a neat place out of the way. So if you're out there with your partner or a small group, hopefully spaced out, um, put five minutes in when you're done. If, you're, if your arms are spent and you had a good climbing day, just kick some rocks to the side of the trail um, or just clean some stuff up. If everyone does that, it's an amazing amount of work that can be accomplished doing that. Um, so the third question is in terms of reporting stuff. Um, I think TCC is still working on an official way to kind of provide a feedback loop, like there's a loose rock here or whatnot. In the meantime, I would say um, there is a Facebook page where I think a lot of people are members of. That's a really easy way to reach a fair amount of us. Um, or just let um, someone at Armadillo know, Joe or whatnot, they can connect with people that, are, that need to know. Usually, like I said, it's three degrees of separation between someone that's active out there and one of us. So if you pass it on to someone, they'll probably know who to talk to. Um, but we'll pro we probably should work on some kind of way of formally having an, either an email address for TCC or whatnot to med wall issues. So um, to be continued on that one. Um, all right, so Levi, the, this is being recorded and anybody else who joined late. Um, so you can watch this later. I got it started like 30 seconds too late, but most of it's recorded. Um, we had a couple, thank you, Karina. We had a couple questions about grades. Um, one specifically, how hard is bow-legged women? And uh, one is how much potential is there for routes 5, 12, and harder? Ah, so I'm gonna, Joe, I'm gonna have to kick that back to you because you're the grade master with all the setting experience. Um, bow-legged traditionally has been given 11B. Um, if I'm in shape, it feels like 11B. It just depends on the season. Uh, I, the grades there were kind of interesting because back in the day, and this is probably true of any area that was pretty much climbed in a small, by a small group at the beginning, um, I think we tended to a certain degree, at least I did, to rate conservatively and not try to inflate grades a lot. Some grades were probably brought down a little bit because people didn't, I would say, know any better about what they're rated. So. When I post like topos online, I say, take it with a grain of salt. I'm okay with someone telling me that a grade is way off. Um, I, I think traditionally bow-legged has been given 11B. I think it's harder than the other 11B cute to the right because I can't crimp on really tiny holds. Uh, but Joe walked it the other week. So I'd kick it back to Joe to see what he really thinks the grade is. Oh, um, I'd probably say like 11C, 11D. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a conversation like as a community and you know, we figure out where the consensus is. Um, and I, I've been trying to use some certain Rhymers routes as benchmarks. Um, like a few weeks ago before we put a couple things in, I climbed a couple like a 12A and 11C and 11D at Rhymers. So I kind of had those in my mind looking at some of those routes. Um, so I'd, I would say bow-legged, probably like 11C. It's essentially one pretty hard, hard move. Um, and that's why some of the routes are kind of tricky to grade because it'll be a lot of easier climbing to a short boulder problem. It's not, there's, they're not really endurance based um, like maybe some Rhymers routes are. Um, so th they can be a little hard to grade and depending on how you feel and maybe it's, maybe it'll feel 11B in the fall when it's not a hundred degrees outside um, and crimping on that little sharp piece of slippery chert. Um, but it's, it's something that, yeah, yeah, I think there'll be a lot of conversations about grades as people climb out there more. Um, as to potential for routes 512 and harder, there's definitely two that, that I've top roped and played around on uh, that I think one will be 12A or B, and the other one probably like 12, 12 BC. Um, so those will be the two hardest that I'm aware of as we clean some more areas and drop more ropes and explore some of the other uh, areas that haven't really been climbed before, there might be potential for some more hard stuff. Um, again, with the caveat that anything hard, it'll be like a roped boulder problem. It's not gonna be a, a long sustained 13A, um, but there could be like a, you know, a V7, V8 boulder problem up one of these short faces. One of the tricky things in looking for harder routes is the rock is really featured. So you can contrive a really hard route, but there could be a huge jugs two feet left of it. And you know, you could call it a 12D, but if you you know, if you reach just a little bit further right, you can, you know, climb it at 510. So it, it's not the best place to be looking for you know, really hard test pieces. Um, but I think, I think there'll be a few good ones. Um, I know that the 12 a that we just cleaned on Metro, I think is going to be really cool. Um, I think every crag should have like a good 12 a get people climbing that level and something to aspire to if you haven't climbed the 12 before. Um, and we'll see, hopefully there'll be a few more harder things. Yeah. To, to, Pony on what uh, Joe said, uh, the reason that is at uh, Medwall is it, it tends to be a very vertical rock that's very featured. Um, the lower, just the geology out there, the lower section is bullet hard. It's some of the best limestone I've ever climbed on, but it's sort of slabby. So it's, it's easy, but it's really hard rock. And then there tends to be about two thirds height, a more broken section of rock that's smoother. And that's where all the difficulty comes from is there's a section of rock that is either little crimpy moves and they're boulder problems or there's a steep section and then you get into an upper section of really good pockets yet again so it's the nature there is it's not going to be a steep endurance problem like you'd get out at rhymers um at like insect wall or something like that but it is moderate paradise out there like that's kind of what medwall's bread and butter is is if you like climbing five eight to ten plus it, it goes toe to toe with rhymers and then some, in my opinion, um, they're longer, the rock is better. Um, it tends to be more vertical. So if you're learning to climb that grade, you can sit on your feet more and kind of think through the moves. Um, and when you're ready to jump up, it tips back a little bit in certain climbs, but man, if you liked eight flake before it fell off there, there's six, eight flakes that are better out there in my opinion. Um, in terms of really good moderate climbs. So, um, the other exciting thing about that is, is, man, you can take your kids out there. Like a lot of places are hard, but if you have, like I have uh, a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old um, and a lot of climbing is hard for them because it tends to be steeper or smaller holds and whatnot. You can take your kids out there. I mean, bring a helmet and there's some loose rock and whatnot, but man, you can go out and have a really good day with their kids out there um, on some really fun, tall climbs that they will just eat up. So it, in terms of being excited about family climbing and being home by lunchtime, Medwall is where it's at. It's really good. Uh, somebody asked if there are any current restrictions on climbing at Medwall or accessing it. Well, 
uh, right now, I think basically it's you climb where the routes are. Um, th at some point, like right now, we don't have a lot of people accessing it from the top. There is a top trail. Um, additional signage is going to go up. We, we're going to ask that people don't access any part of the wall past the top of Old Testament, essentially where uh, there's a climb called Bermuda Triangles, which the anchors are right below the edge of the cliff on a very kind of like a prominent overlook. We're probably going to ask people don't go past that point. The reason being is the, uh, the ground starts to slope and become loose and there's just a lot of loose dirt and rock that can get kicked down. And getting to the tops of the cliff over there is not something we want people doing. Um, there's a lot of slip and fall hazards, unfortunately. So in terms of restrictions, we're going to say at some point there'll be a sign, don't go past this point. But really, if you can't get to the top rope by just walking up and looking over the edge, we're going to ask people not to go tromping through the woods. Um, the other restriction, and I think that's on the signs, is that um, we don't want people top roping off of anything that's not bolted. So essentially, again, only climb the climbs that are in place right now. Um, there's reasons for that in terms of preserving the trees, but also a lot of the rock out there and we, a lot of the work we put in is a lot of that rock required a fair amount of work to get kind of solid. Some of that was really good from the get go, but um, Joe and I can tell stories of sitting there pulling chunks of rock. Joe sent a, a, a piece of rock that was the size of your refrigerator, refrigerator down off the wall. So if the rock hasn't been cleared and kind of prepped, we, we don't want people really trying to go explore that stuff primarily because it's not ready yet. And, um, we don't want you pulling stuff down. Um, one of the big things is we don't want to have people getting injured out there, particularly literally just open. Um, it's just not a good look, particularly in this time and space with medical response and stuff like that. So I would say stick to the clean stuff. You'll enjoy it a lot more. And that the new route potential is there. It's just going to take a lot of work. Yeah. And somebody commented that um, in the crack of Bermuda Triangle, there's a, there's a large loose boulder that it's probably hard to move um it's wedged in there um if people encounter those sorts of obstacles like big loose rocks i mean i guess part of it is going back to you know letting some of us know um is there something else that they can do in the meantime other than not climb not not pull on it yeah i mean part of it is it's still an outdoor crag and um, and we really want it to be a transitional place for people to learn to be safe outside, but um, it, it's not an indoor gym. There, I mean, there's rock everywhere that wants to try to fall on you and whatnot. There's poison ivy and everything. So um, one of the reasons we made a con concerted effort to try to bolt it well, but also provide a learning opportunity is that it's outside. It's not, there's no Disney-fied effect here where it's guaranteed to be safe or something like that. So when people get up and they encounter a loose rock, that's part of climbing and you need to learn how to deal with that. We don't want people to have to run into that, but if you do make a good decision of, am I going to pull it off? Should I send it down? Um, you know, let people know below you. Um, it's Medwall is a great area to kind of take that next step into outdoor climbing where there is more risk involved um, and learn from that in a, a semi-controlled setting. But gravity is still there and rock is still out to get you to a certain degree. Yeah, when I've been out there, I tend to wear my helmet while belaying, but not necessarily while climbing because there's still look not not a lot of big things, but a lot of small pebbles getting kicked off and raining down. So, you know, if you're at the base of the crag, just be aware that if somebody's climbing above you, um, they could knock something off that, you know, could be a hazard. So just just be aware. Um, I think that answered all the questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I think I saw one. Oh, Michael had one about, can we top rub off these anchors or use quick draws? So that's, that's a classic question. Um, so we'll get into that. I know Michael's smiling over there because we had this discussion before. So in the past, like when I was growing up climbing and whatnot, everyone was told to use your own gear on the, on the hardware. And that was like a classic one is always use your own gear. And the reason being is, uh, particularly in the United States, there was no bolt fund, there was nothing. So um, if you were wearing out anchors, you were wearing out anchors. Um, and a lot of times back in the day, we would have rings or something else that would tend to wear a little bit more quickly. Um, so the flip side of that is, 
is that people would use their own gear or whatnot. And sometimes that would result in more, I would say, faffing about at an anchor. If you had to clip anchors in and then you had to re-thread a rope or whatnot, um, it, it just resulted in more complications at the top. And in this stage of my climbing, if there are steel carabiners up there, clip them lower, use them, and then kick five bucks in to the bolt fund. Um, if you're if you're completely competent and you're fine using your own gear, that's great. Once in a while, I'll, if I know, if you know you're going to have, you're going to be running 12 people through that, that top rope and really wearing that anchor out and you got a, a rope that's caked in dirt and is just going to act as a band. So yes, wear out your own gear. But if you're just climbing up and then lowering and maybe having a couple other people run a top rope on it, I encourage people to use the gear that's in place. Um, I know that's counter to what a lot of us have learned growing up, but there's a reason we use steel carabiners. And at some point, TCC is going to, if we have high use routes, we're going to switch over to the big tow hooks. Um, I mean, they literally are a giant tow hook and they have a lot of wear to them. Um, I'm a big believer in if it can be made safer, particularly in this kind of sport climbing environment, why wouldn't you? Um, threading anchors and wrap rings and all that kind of stuff, that has a different realm of trad climbing and granite and more adventure climbing. But if I rode my bike in and I have a latte in my hand, I'm going to clip anchors and lower. And I, I encourage people to do that. Like that's, um, I just, a lot of times in my 30 year career, I've seen accidents or I've heard of accidents where something happens at an anchor, particularly with inexperienced climbers trying to do some weirdness at the top. I, I there's just no reason to do that. We have the gear there. It's, been, it's put in place. Just use it. Um, if you see something wearing out or you feel guilty about, man, I just, I just had, 15 of my best friends run through there and I had this rope that I put like a bunch of powdered sand in and you groove it. Each one of those carabiners is like five or six bucks. So kick a couple bucks to the fund and we'll replace it. Like I'd rather have people be safe and not drink a coffee one day and replace the gear. It's just better to go that way. Um, that leads to a good question from Galen. Um, and this again comes back to Matt's expertise and his desire to share all this knowledge. But there's something really cool and unique that some of you guys may have noticed if you've been out there is um, what Matt calls med wall. No, med school, med school. Um, do you want to talk about med school a little bit? Sure. So getting back to kind of that safety thing. So a story I can tell is when I was out there years and years ago, I was climbing, I think it was crossover all the way to the top. And you get to the top. And back then, they were just, um, you see these at E-Rock, again, a traditional area, but they were just fixed rings on the wall. So when you, after you use your gear, the last person down would have to clip in at the anchor and untie the rope and thread the anchor. And that's a skill everyone should have as a climber. But at MedWall, because we tend to, it's the accessibility means that people are going to have a lower experience level. They may not know how to do that. And unfortunately, in the past, a lot of people would learn how to do that, hanging off something, hanging up on the wall with a partner yelling up to them. And I saw that in person at MedWall where literally the guy next to me on Bermuda Triangles was tethered in with something. I'm even sure it was. And his partner is trying to tell him how to untie the rope, thread it through the rings, and retie 25 meters off the ground. And you could tell this guy had no idea what he was doing. So I kind of had to traverse over, clip in next to him, and talk him through the process and get them safe and lower them down. And this is when we have nothing but rings. And if you've climbed long enough, you've seen this somewhere. And there's no place that you can learn those skills safely that I've ever been to. You typically have to watch a video or back in my day, it was literally a paper book you had to watch and do something on your refrigerator or whatnot. So when we were cleaning up the wall, there's an area to the left of Old Testament that has maybe 12 or 15 feet of rock before it ledges out. So really there's not a lot of climbing potential there other than some short, maybe an easy one or two boulder problems. So we looked at this area and the more we looked at it, the more we realized it's perfect for a learning zone. So to the left of Old Testament, uh, if you follow the base trail, we have installed a fair amount of the number of anchors that you'll see anywhere you go climbing. And I can, we can try to put some pictures up. I didn't have the space to do that, but what we, the theory was you can teach your partner or you can learn yourself how to use these different anchors. So we have a med wall anchor where you can just clip in two things. So if you have a newer partner you want to teach how to take and lower, you can literally step two feet off the ground and have your partner take and lower you. Yeah, it's not exciting, but you can go through the whole process in a safe environment. And the next anchor over is kind of your classic two hanging chains. 
So a lot of old sport climbs, someone would just literally bolt two pieces of chain to the wall and you'd have to learn how to thread those. Well, there's actually really good resources. I think ACM GA and a bunch of different climbing um, guide services have videos to teach you how to do this thread and lower things. We've put those kind of anchors in place so you can practice that on the ground in a safe environment. So there's a set of chains, there's a set of rings. Um, we have horizontal rings like you see at E-Rock a lot. Um, we have vertical rings like you'll see in places like Squamish where you can, and you can also practice setting up a belay. So if you're starting to try to think about multi-pitching or something like that, we even have a set of anchors where you have to make about three moves and there's a little ledge about a meter off the ground with a multi-pitch anchor set up right there. So it'll be the shortest multi-pitch you've ever done, but you can climb up, you can rig an anchor, you can bring your partner up and then you can practice threading that anchor and, repelling off the wall um, and if you mess up you might bruise yourself a little bit but it's a way better place to learn than a, two pitches up in e-rock or something like that and we're hoping some at some point there's other sections we're looking at where we'll, you'll be able to wrap down to that ledge or i, I know um, one of the guys that's helped us clean is looking at the world's shortest multi-pitch where we might have three pitches that are each like six meters each or two meters each where someone can do multi-pitch practice and kind of get that experience in an environment. So that area is called med school. There's actually even some cracks over there, amazingly. So the aspiring trad climber can go try to practice building some anchors. It's in limestone, so you got to take what you can get there. But that whole section, I really encourage people to spread the word on that, that if you see someone that seems a little bit new to the game, to send them over to med school and they can go practice that kind of stuff. Um, at some point, I'm hoping that we can have some links either on the Facebook page or maybe Armadillo can send out something with videos. Um, there's a bunch of good registered guide services that show you how to do those things. Um, and you can just take those and go practice those skills. I always tell people that are trying to learn, read the book, do your homework, and then go practice those things in a classroom. And that's literally one of the best classrooms we have around here. So that's med school, at least how we're working it to be. Um, we got kind of a big one from Josh. Um, he asked if we could touch on etiquette um, for people who are new to climbing. Um, I will say that I did a like gym to crag Zoom um, in April, or was that March? It's been so long. Um, but that's on the Armadillo Boulders YouTube page. Um, and it covers some of that, a little bit of etiquette, a little bit of some of the basics of moving from the gym to the crag if you've never been out there. Um, and once you know, we're back to a little more normal and we can have more in-person meetings and functions at the gym. That's something that we hope to do more of because um, I think that's a really valuable um, service for us to provide as Armadillo Boulders. Um, but what are a couple like key etiquette things? Um, they asked how far should they stay away from other groups? Is there any expectation that we'll get off a section after a certain time? I, um. I mean, yeah, it's, it kind of gets complicated, particularly, I mean, right now we're in some weird times, for, um, for lack of a better term. And um, it, like, as I mentioned before, and it was brought up, like my wife sees the reports coming in at BAMC every day. So right now I would say etiquette is, I really encourage people every day we're reading more and more about wearing a mask. I know they're hot and they're a pain. Um, I've spent, Joe and I have spent 100 plus hours with an N95 or something like that. Um, conveniently drilling a lot of holes in rock creates rock dust, which requires, at least I wear a mask because I don't want to get lung damage. Um, I know climbers that did that for 20 years and actually have lung issues from sucking all the rock dust in. So the same mask you need for COVID, you need to drill rock holes. So we've been doing that. Um, so I can tell you, you can survive five hours out there um, sweating and doing everything with some kind of mask on. Um, so I would say and that's why I post, I think recently, like TCC has guidelines for rhymers. We just try to do that right now. We want to look like the good user group and not the one that's having a pool party in someone's backyard um, and encourage others to do that. Um, in terms of general etiquette and whatnot, uh, I think the biggest thing we're trying to teach people is, and this is a big push from the Access Fund and a lot of other outdoor companies is, it's not the gym. And we need to kind of treat it as such where uh, in the gym, we might have a really hard boulder problem or a route where we're trying to work where we're yelling and having a grand old time. It is an outdoor environment. And this is kind of hearkening back to my upbringing where 
my first experience was it was an outdoor research program. We were trying to, you know, we, we learned to pick up trash and not litter and that kind of stuff. We're trying to encourage those ethics out at Medwell too. Um, people may not realize it, but we can hear when we were when we were doing the work out there, we can hear every conversation on that bike path from 40, 40 yards away. And th the same is true for every climber. Every climber on that wall, the the Grammy and grandpa that are riding their bikes down there can hear everything you're saying when you're climbing on that route. So the person that pitches off bow-legged woman and throws a cursing fit, you know, grandpa, whoever can see that and go, well, I don't like that climbing group at all. So encouraging, I would say, outdoor etiquette and putting the best foot forward and telling people that perhaps aren't behaving that way, that probably bringing in line um, is, is a good way to go in terms of just general behavior. Um, I can't tell you how many people would wander up to the cliff. It's so easy to get to and just watch. Um, we've had families come up and we were doing development. So think how you want to be perceived by the family with two young kids. That's probably how you should behave all the time out there in terms of general etiquette, have a good time, try hard or whatnot, but that's kind of how you want to go about doing it. Um, we don't want to be the group that's a bit surly and, you know, you keep your kids away from them when they're climbing up. We want the kids to try to get into it. We want to encourage people to want to climb and get to know us as a user group. Um, in terms of general etiquette, um, just kind of the usual thing, uh, I always tell people just be a good person. So if you're climbing and someone's waiting for that route and they're being respectful and whatnot, don't take all day on it. And if you think like if you're projecting something, these are kind of things, let them know, hey, I'm trying to work this for a little bit. Is that okay? Get an idea of what your fellow climber is looking to do. Generally speaking, we're a pretty nice group and just a little bit of being nice to your fellow climber goes a long way. Um, that's just, hey, are you trying to get on this? Well, I'll try to get my rope off there. Hey, I'm sorry I left that rope hanging up there. Um, I won't be too much longer, is that cool? Just that kind of stuff um, goes a long way. All right, well, I think that's, that's pretty good. So thank you very much, Matt. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys all out at Rimer or uh, Medwall or the gym soon. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for maybe more of this from Matt because we want to hear more from Matt. <laughs> so I, I guess anyone have any other last questions before we sign off? I can open up if there's anything last minute. Someone want to chime in? Oh, good. All right. Well, if you have anything else, feel free to email. I know like there's an email list going out if you have any follow-up stuff or um, – in terms of I, one thing I forgot to cover, I realized in my presentation is where do I find out about the routes? Um, Joe and I are currently trying to update the mountain project page. If you, you're, if you haven't been to that online resource, that's kind of the, the, the gathering zone of internet information for at least North America. Um, and it comes with all the caveats of the forums are a mess sometimes. Um, I hang out in the technical forums because some of the other stuff can be interesting. Um, but there is a, map, uh, a medicine wall page now that we're currently trying to update. That's gonna be your best resource. There is a Facebook page as well that we try to update, but in terms of if you're not into that or you want, um, whatnot, uh, the, the what am I trying to say? mountain project page is uh, where you wanna go for uh, beta and whatnot. And we'll have topos up there. At some point when we get closer to kind of saturation of routes, there'll probably be some kind of print book that we'll put together and it'll be in the local climbing shops, Armadillo, carry it. REI, something like that. That's a long way off though. Publishing is, that's, <laughs> Michael's laughing at me on the side. So some point we'll have something. What I really would like to do is gather some more history and get some more information there so people can have some kind of little pamphlet there. I'm a big believer in bookshelf history, um, support guidebooks and whatnot. That's always a really good thing. Uh, it's the way you grow as a climber. One of them is reading books and saying, I want to go there. Medwall is not necessarily that place, but getting a really good, pretty guidebook to some other place like Red Rocks or Squamish or whatever and saying, someday I want to go climb there. That keeps you motivated when we're all stuck inside and it's 100 degrees outside. So um, go get that kind of stuff and you, you'll be a lot more stoked to go climbing um, in the, when the fall comes, we hope. All right. Thank you, everybody, for stopping in. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Mm-hmm. <laughs>